Hey, I'm Andy. If you don't know me, it's probably because I'm not famous. But I did start a men's grooming company called Harry's. The idea for Harry's came out of a frustrating experience I had buying razor blades. Most brands were overpriced, overdesigned, and out of touch. At Harry's, our approach is simple. Here's our secret. We make sharp, durable blades and sell them at honest prices for as low as $2 each. We care about quality so much that we do some crazy things, like buy a world-class German blade factory. Obsessing over every detail means we're confident in offering a 100% quality guarantee. Millions of guys have already made the switch to Harry's, so thank you if you're one of them. And if you're not, we hope you give us a try with this special offer. Get a Harry starter set with a five-blade razor, weighted handle, shave gel, and a travel cover. All for just three bucks, plus free shipping. Just go to harrys.com and enter code FACE at checkout. That's harrys.com, code FACE. Enjoy! Way back in 2005, two brothers set off on a road trip that would save the world and change television. Ernie and Bert? No. For 15 seasons and 327 episodes, Supernatural took audiences on a wild ride of family, fate, and faith with a rocking soundtrack and a seriously cool car. But that was then, Bobbo, and this is now. And yes, the show has quote-unquote ended, but we're not quite done with the journey. No, we're not. And that's why we're watching it all over again, or for Rob and me, for the first time, that's right. diving deep into every episode of Supernatural with the fine folks who made it. And we're taking you along for the ride. Whether you like it or not. I'm Rob Benedict. I played Chuck Shirley, a.k.a. God. Uh, spoiler! Yeah, it is a bit of a spoiler, but hey, spoilers are fair game here. Ah, uh, fine. And I'm Richard Spate Jr., and I played the Trickster, also known as the Archangel Gabriel. And I did a little bit of Loki work in there. Okay, you know we're running out of time. Okay, well, we'll be talking about the entire series, so whatever we say, accept it. You've been warned. So buckle up and settle in. Because this, my friend, is Supernatural, then and now. Hey, everybody. This is Rob Benedict. And I... (laughs) Who are you? (laughs) I'm Rich Spade. Okay. We're uh, talking today about episode 107. Hookman. Hookman. Man with a hook. Also known as Hookman. Or Hookman, if your last name is Hookman. (laughs) So in this episode, Sam and Dean come across an article about a murder in Iowa that they suspect to be the legendary Hookman. (laughs) (laughs) They head there to investigate and meet Lori, the person who witnessed the murder. And deaths continue to happen around her, and Sam and Dean expect it has something to do with her puritanical preacher father. It's always about the puritanical preacher father, right? That's right. right. Who happened to be... Dan Butler. Dan Butler from Frasier. I know. But it's tied to her and her cursed necklace. Is it cursed or cursed necklace? Damn that cursed necklace that they discover is the melted silver of the original hook man from no, the 19th century. It's not the it's not the melted silver. It's the smelted silver hook. Melted smelted. You know what they say. <laughs> In our notes here it says smelted instead of melted. But I think it's smelted. It was smelt. <laughs> and it like when you take silver and you oh, you smelt silver. Is that right? Yeah. When, you sm- when you melt silver it's smelted. It's def it's different than whoever smelt it dealt it. It's not that smelt. Melt that sucker. All right, so we got a lot of smelting in this episode. Listen, uh, let's let's take it back down to Robin Rich's review notes. Let's talk about, I'm sure there's a great musical hit right here where Robin Rich reviewed the show. Hit that cue. <laughs> Robin Rich's review notes. Okay, Rob, you start. I just noticed in this episode that Dean is always horny. Dean is always checking out every, they pull up at a car, a hot extra walks by, Dean looks. You know, um, it's not Jensen, it's Dean. Dean's looking. Right. If there's a hot girl, he's like, oh, hey, hello, hey to you. Uh, Did you notice that? I I mean, I guess I just, having spent a lot of time with you, it doesn't, that kind of behavior doesn't shock me anymore. Okay, all right. <laughs> but I, I, um, <laughs> it's just, it's a part of Dean having, knowing, you know, I'm, I'm more familiar with later Dean, whose voice got deeper with every season. But this Dean, he says, he's ready to date whoever. They pull into a town as a good looking gal. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's in. Is that a crime? Yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. He likes the ladies. He likes the ladies. So let's talk about the story, though. Like, what do you think of the episode? What, what was your opinion on the whole thing? Be honest. Um, I thought it was great. You know, this is a this is an old story. The Hookman story is an old story that we, with, heck, I told it around a campfire in my day. So it was fun to see it play out. As always, the guest stars are great. Yeah. I took issue with the fact that in the opening scene, the pervy frat guy trying to get to the third base right out of the gate was named Rich. 
<laughs> well, I thought that was appropriate. I took that, I took that personally. I thought it was you for a second. Uh, and then I remembered it was just a, a bad memory of that time that you hit on me in that car. Yeah, it, it feels like an 80s slasher. It feels like an 80s slasher movie, but, which I love. Again, and I, okay, so I thought this episode was really fun. And we are not, Rob and I, people listening, we are not going to be the people who come on here and love every episode of Supernatural. There's going to be an episode or two that we don't love. And we're going to tell you mm -hmm. because we may lie to each other, but never to you. No, we wouldn't do that to you. And so I thought this was super fun because, again, the effect of the whole thing, like the hook going across the sign at the beginning, just scraping past Great, the sign. Yeah. So cool. And the car. So creepy. And the, and the body hanging up on the car. That that shot oh, was so great. So creepy. Um. Again, just going back to Dean, he's Jensen's so funny too. I love the comic bits that he gets to do. They give him a lot of little funny bits. He really is, his character really is kind of like Harrison Ford in Star Wars, which we're going to get into later when we interview McG. Yeah, you know, Rob and I get some guff in the fan mail. We get stacks and stacks of fan mail each week mm -hmm. uh, for, about this podcast. And we read everyone. And they say, gosh, you guys uh, talk, talk like you haven't seen the show before. That's kind of, you know, insulting. Right. But we only do that because we haven't seen the show before. Mm -hmm. Um, so you need to know that when we're acting like we've never seen this before, it's not a bit, we haven't seen it before. And we, I think that makes us a good audience for the show because we're coming to it with fresh eyeballs. That's right. I literally, you know what I did yesterday with my day, Rich? What? I, uh, I binged Supernatural. Oh, wow. Yeah. I watched like five or six episodes. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, it's part of the gig now, Robbie. You got gig. You can't show up here and not know. <laughs> um, another little note. I love these things, but Dean is reading a fake porn magazine in the frat house called Backside. <laughs> it's a very, <laughs> very clean way of yes. having a filthy magazine. Buttocks. <laughs> <laughs> Tush Weekly. <laughs> nice um, behinds. There's also a half calf joke, which I thought was funny. I love the little things that make it that eight that do age it. Two thousand five, Jensen says to Jared. Dean says to Sam, like, "Oh, your half calf. Got your half calf latte here." Like that's a joke. <laughs> and that now that's just something people order. Well, also you mentioned your opinion of Dean and that character and how different it was for you back then. I think the same thing about watching Sam. Yeah, because Sam sounds like. Oh, gee, I think, shucks. Well, I think he sounds like he just went surfing. I feel like he's he, not at Stanford, but UC San Diego. He's like, Dean, we got to go over there. I mean, the girl seems tormented. Well, like, they, they he really. Just, he yeah. sounds like a surfer to me. Both of them are the, a little bit more of the sort of, um, again, if if Dean is, is Harrison Ford, then. Jared is Matthew McConaughey. No, he's definitely Jared is Luke. You know, and, and he's got oh. that sort of like, he's a little more innocent, definitely the little brother and, um, you yeah, know, the, the enormous so, little, the enormous little brother, but he is, he's endearing, you know, you want to give him a hug, the poor guy. He, right, he always, well, <laughs> you know, you want to get a ladder and give him a hug. Um, <laughs> no, he's, uh, you know, he's the one that's like, uh, Dean always saddles him with the hard jobs. Yeah. Like here, you do this while I go hit on this girl. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'll distract the hot one. Yeah. You go deal with, with that guy. Just one last note what? From, from Rob about the episode. You're Rob. Why are you using your name and not a pronoun? I always do that. You know that. Rob is weird. Uh, he is. Is that uh, there's nothing scarier than like a scary old preacher from the 19th century. Ah, oh, you know right? I mean? With a hook. <laughs> if I had a nickel. Um, okay, today it's going to be, it's a great episode, guys. We're talking to two different people. Yeah, this is not a one interview show today. No, it's a two interview show. First, we're going to be talking to executive producer Mick G. Really, you could say, no Mick G, no Supernatural. That's true. And, you know, really having his stamp on it really gave it a very uh, legitimate presence. Oh, yeah, man. And if you don't know who Mick G is, well, you've seen his movies. I mean, he you know, kicked off his career. Music videos for everybody who was anybody in right. the 90s. Smash Mouth, Offspring, Sugar Ray, Corn, Cypress Hill. Yeah, and then he uh, jumped into directing features. He did Charlie's Angels. Yeah. Of the massive uh, Also Terminator, Salvation, We Are Marshall, uh, Rim of the World. Man, I loved We Are Marshall. Honestly, I would have him back just to talk We Are Marshall. Yeah? Well, maybe we'll do that on a, our third podcast. <laughs> Our We Are Marshall rewatch. Mc, McG movies. <laughs> Other notable TV credits, Turner and Hooch, The O.C., Lethal Weapon, Nikita, and Chuck. Chuck, which featured... Not me. Josh Gomez. Oh. Ah, Rick Gomez's brother. Wow. Well, it's, it's, it's a character I played on Supernatural, but it had nothing to do with me. Oh, right. It had nothing to do with And uh, after that, we're going to talk to Jane McGregor, who's the actress who played Laurie. Such a huge part of this episode. Oh, man. She was all over this, this joint. A great role, and she did a great job with it. She did uh, a great job with it and got to, got to make out with Jared Padalecki. And uh, who wouldn't? Sign me up. Get, grab me a ladder. And, and put me in line for that. Why don't you just not put the ladder away? You continually need just, it. I'm always holding a ladder when he's around. And Jane, uh, you might know her since then uh, from Snowpiercer, A Dog's Purpose. She's had guest spots on Fargo. Fringe. And Almost Human. Mm -hmm. So we're talking to both of those people. 
and ah, oh, geez, buddy, let's get into it. We better get cranking. All right, first up, McG. It's such an honor and a pleasure to have with us one of the big chiefs of the show. Maybe the big chief of the, the show. The big chief. Please welcome to our show, McG. Hey, McG. Hello, guys. What's happening? Not much, man. How you doing? In a word, can you guys explain the stickiness of Supernatural for 15 years? Rich? Can I hyphenate Jared and Jensen? <laughs> Jared and Jensen. I think that's a fair answer. Yeah. I mean, the chemistry is really, really uh, special, isn't it? Yeah. Family. You know, I was, having done so many conventions with this show as, you know, part of it, the sense of family that those guys brought to the show, the sense of family that Eric Kripke and the whole idea that you guys brought to the original concept and then the fandom sort of clinging to each other as family as well, that bond seems to be the, the through line that permeates every facet of that show. And I feel like the fandom felt that and therefore it felt authentic. Also, I think there's the phenomenon of social media, which came to rise as this show was beginning and it was the first time that people were tweeting about it and the studios were kind of listening and I think that developed this sort of small group of fans that developed yeah. via social media they could bond with each other and and say how much they loved the show and it became this almost cult favorite show and it kept it 100%. chugging along but let's rewind the tape and let's let's talk about the origin story of the entire series which really falls in your lap so you're a Big deal film and pilot director at the time, still are, and at the time, Wonderland Pictures is your company, and here comes a young, strapping Eric Kripke in to pitch you a show, essentially. I mean... Well, it, it sort of began a year or so prior to that. We were doing the OC, and um, a guy named Peter Johnson was running drama at Fox, okay? And Peter was sort of ready to go solo and get out of the corporate world. And, and he, we had a good time on that show. So he wanted to come work with Stephanie Savage and me over at Wonderland. And so Peter Johnson came over and the first thing he did is like, you know, this guy, Eric Kripke, he's amazing. You got to talk to Kripke, you know, this, that, the other. And he was part of a fraternity that, that gave birth to some very lively characters, you know, out of USC is my understanding. Anyway, so Kripke comes in and he's just sort of out of his mind, like this mad scientist. He goes, I have Star Wars and Truck Stop America. I'm like, what the f are you talking about, man? And he goes on to pitch the whole thing out and Peter's sort of ramping it up like, yeah, this is going to be great. And he's had this idea for a long time. And um, we were partnered with a very legendary character named Peter Roth out at Warner Brothers oh, Television. Sure. Oh, yeah. Who's probably one of the most important television executives in the history of Hollywood. Really? And I'm, I'm not I'm not being hyperbolic. He's no. that level. Yeah. And we broke it down to him. And the rest is, as they say, history. We took it to it was the WB at the time. It was prior to the CW. Yeah. And they went for it. I think one thing that people don't understand is the show worked, but it was not a smash. For a show that went on to be, my understanding is, the longest running American science fiction show in television history. Yeah. Right. It's not like it was easy from day one. It was like we kind of got picked up for the back end of the first season and then got picked up for season two. And then we sort of made it happen for season three. And it was like that for a long, long time until it became like, okay, this thing's a big engine and a lot of people like it. At what point did it turn from having to like pray you're going to get another season to like it actually just being that machine? Late. I mean, I'd say every bit of seven, eight, nine years. Oh, wow. You know I mean? wow. wow. It, well, also, do you got to understand the CW prior to the Mark Pedowitz tenure that mm -hmm. we're still in now was, you know, it was like a, a funky experiment that was half the CBS group and half the Warner brothers group. And they didn't know if they were going to stick with it or, right. you know, it was kind of an engine to get shows going domestically so they could spin it off and sell the shows internationally. And that was also a saving grace for us because ghost stories travel very well as opposed to like American football stories, you know, they don't play in Europe, but right. ghost stories and stuff do. Yeah, um, Mark Pedowitz is the, the head of the CW now, and uh, yeah, and at the time, so this was the only show left over from the WB, and as I understand it, it was sort of the bastard stepchild in that way, because it's the only leftover show, right, that CW right, kept. but I'm very comfortable in that red-haired stepchild space, so I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's right where we want to be from a place of trying to survive, but we were, we were populated with very talented people. Again, Kripke was the tip of the spear, but Stephanie Savage, who was running Wonderland at the time, I met her working for Drew Barrymore and Nancy Javon and at Flower Films when I was making the Charlie's Angels pictures, and it was just clear she was a genius. And she went on to write a lot with Josh Schwartz and the OC, and now she's gone on to be one of the most important writers in town. 
So Stephanie was there. Peter Johnson was there. Kripke was there to whatever degree I could chip in. I was there. David Nutter did the pilot. I mean, a lot of smart people were really pulling for the show and the vision of what Kripke wanted to do was crystal clear. And then when we cast Jared and Jensen, that was it. I mean, that was, that's what we Okay, that sentence right there has a lot, a lot to pick apart. Just hold that thought. We're coming right back. Hey, this is Richard Spate. You know what? It's 2024. It's a brand new year. And I bet you made some New Year's resolutions. And I bet one of them was to eat healthier. Well, you can get cranking on that resolution right now, my friend, with Factor. Factor's ready-to-eat meal delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, the prep work, the cooking fatigue. I'm getting tired just talking about it. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. With over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more, plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you will have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart this resolution off right. Forget frantic lunch prep and rush dinner making. That stinks. Factors two-minute meals, yes, I said two minutes, are your secret weapon in the new year. You get to fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals all delivered right to your door. It doesn't get any easier than that. And Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep you going no matter what's on the schedule. So I know what you're asking. Rich, how do I tap into this Factor magic? You head to factormeals.com slash SPNTAN50 and use code SPNTAN50 to get 50% off. That's a lot off. That's code SPNTAN50 at factormeals.com slash SPNTAN50 for 50% off. Make that resolution happen now and make it happen at a discount. Fantastic food that's healthy and delicious and delivered right to my door. Now that is how you start the new year off right. Thanks for listening, everybody. And now back to the episode. So here's a question for you. Obviously, you were a big, big time success at the before the show got going, which is why you were so instrumental in getting it into the right hands. Did you ever contemplate directing the pilot? Was that ever on the table? It was absolutely on the table. I, I intended to direct the pilot. I intended to direct the pilot of the OC as well. It's happened several times, but features just take so long. There are scheduling problems with great regularity. And, um, you know, in this one, we were lucky to have David Nutter, who was the, one of the sexiest pilot directors in the, in the history of the game. So we, that, no one was bummed out that I wasn't doing it because Nutter was doing it. And that was, by most estimates, a step up. So that was cool. But yeah, I would have been thrilled to do it. But I was busy on, I think I was probably busy. I was busy on Superman. JJ and I were working on Superman at the time. And um, yeah, so like the schedule, schedule just didn't align. But thank God it didn't because I never would have done the job that Nutter did. And uh, we're all, the beneficiaries of his talent. He's he's a beast. Yeah, he's a legend. And we've talked a little bit to Jared and Jensen about him being the pilot master that he was, especially back in the day, like 17 in a row or something like that, where he he shot the pilot and the shows got picked up. Good batting average. Yeah, exactly. Was he was he already a part of the conversation when you knew you had to step back? Or is that or is that did that sweeten the pot? You're like, oh, if Nutters can do it, then I'm gonna sleep easy. Or shit, I can't do it. We better find somebody. Let's call Nutter. Well, I was in sort of deep shit with Warner Brothers. And again, that just goes to Nutter had a deal with Peter Roth at Warner's. He was coming off the Smallville pilot and stuff like that. And I had a deal at Warner Brothers and Peter's running television and two guys are running film, primarily Alan Horn, who runs Disney now, and a guy named Barry Meyer that was running the whole thing. It was just interesting because I was on Superman, but the problem was I was terribly agoraphobic and Superman was getting ready to shoot down in Australia. And I went and talked to those guys. I'm like, I can't, I, I can't fly. I can't go to Australia. I'm, I'm afraid to get on that plane. And they're like, you're McGee. It'll be fine. You know, come on <laughs> and cut to, you know, the Warner jets on the tarmac and ready to go. And, um, you know, I can't get on the plane and it's just terribly humiliating. And it was Peter Roth and Alan Horn and Barry Meyer had to figure out what to do with this McGee character because I was doing good things for them in a film way, but also in a television way. The television thing was starting to pick up momentum and steam. 
And um, I don't know, in the end, it, it all worked out. But uh, again, like getting Nutter was a good thing for us in the pilot. And that helped take some pressure off my f-ing up the thing at Warner Brothers. Right. And getting Doug Lyman to do the pilot on the OC was a good thing for us. And then oh, I yeah, went back yeah. and did the pilot on Chuck with, you know, Josh and Fedak. And I just saw Fedak's name. I think he just wrote the new Michael Bay picture that's coming out, Ambulance. Oh, wow. Wow. So like just, it's, 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 a, it's a beautifully tight family of people crossing paths. And I, I suppose it's the one silver lining to getting old, shall I say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> older, is that, older. Is that curious? Uh, just curious. Or is that something you still struggle with? Well, I mean, that was sort of a low point for me. And I limped into UCLA and saw these two women that help people with problems like mine. So I started doing better. Now I've flown around the world a bunch of times and I'm doing great and I love it. But it's something like if you weighed 600 pounds and then got down to your 180 pound desired weight and people went, wow, you look great, man. You're like, yeah, because I do what I have to do to stay healthy. And if I don't, I'll go back to weighing 600 pounds. And if I don't, I'll probably slip back into the troubles I had from probably age 15 to age, I don't know, 30, 32. I mean, I made those two Charlie's Angels movies without ever getting on a plane and it was sad and depressing and the girls would get invited to go to Buckingham Palace to watch the movie with, you know, the princes and the whole thing. And I'd be like, I'm sick, (laughs) you know, and they kind of knew and they never rubbed it in my face, but it's a way to live. Yeah. That's, you know, it's it's just interesting to have, have you talk about it just because, you know, a lot of our, our fandom deals with things like that. And and Jared has been such a champion of people in recovery and, you know what I mean? And getting over your, yeah, recognizing depression or other issues and sort of, you know, there's no shame in having those kind of concerns and addressing them. No, that's awesome. And that's a, that's a great story that people can relate to. It is. Absolutely. Um, and no, when you, you you mentioned Superman that you're working on with JJ Abrams, is it true that Jared was in the final batch of actors to play Superman. Is that true? Absolutely. Yeah. We, I, I believe we did a camera test. I'm not sure if we did a camera test, but I think we may have done a camera test. Wow. Yeah. That was a small circle of talented, talented people. Yeah. Wow. But cool. yeah, definitely in the final, final mix. Yeah. I buy that. Speaking of final mix, Jared and Jensen, we talked about them at the outset here. We talk about you, you mentioned them in sort of when you're talking about the home run team that you had assembled, their names are a part of that. But they obviously weren't a part of this until you guys went and found them. You know, once you had the great idea and everything else, what do you remember of that process in terms of finding these dudes? Well, it's so funny because that was just old school Hollywood where you would bring in your final selects to the studio. The studio is run by Peter Roth and you would come down to call it one or two, sometimes three choices that you would bring to the network for final casting. And literally these poor sons of bitches would have to sit in little, you know, folding chairs outside these rooms. You guys know, come on. Oh, we know. Oh yeah. And you get called and you have seven minutes to show up and shine. Yeah. And you know, it's the big hitters and you know, Sandy Grushow is running Fox. That's it. You go from like zero to a thousand and you're in a room and you guys know it well, and you just gotta, you gotta show up and shine. And they did. And then it really, really took off and we did chem reads with the two of them. And one of my favorite moments was when we went, the show got picked up. Explain what the upfronts are though, for people who are listening, who don't know what that event is. Well, the the upfronts is when, when the big hitters at the corresponding networks decide in May, what they're going to debut in the fall. The fall is when the biggest, loudest TV shows come out. At least traditionally that's getting changed now with streaming Mm -hmm. or what have you. Right. But you get this great call and your show got picked up and you fly to New York and they announce you at Madison square garden. And it's super, super, or the Javits center or something super fun. Yeah. And I remember going, I think I even flew because that's when I was getting a little bit better and starting to fly, but I would fly privately because I was scared to get on a commercial plane, which is terribly expensive. And we were helped by Warner brothers a lot, but I think I went with Jensen if I'm not mistaken, but not Jared for some reason. But anyway, we're all standing backstage and getting ready to introduce the boys to the world and beyond. And it's just one of those moments that you just go, I'm, I'm so lucky to have lived that moment with those guys and who knew them. And I, I even have a picture of us standing there and like the show hasn't aired. You don't know. Shit. Yeah. You know, the stats that nine out of 10 shows crash and burn don't, you know, they just go nine episodes and then it's, yeah. you're dumped. And uh, you know, they were too good to be denied. Yeah. That's and amazing. nice guys, man. Like that, that's what everybody should know. Like they really treated everybody up in Vancouver, like family. They became Canadians for God's sake, for all intents and purposes. Yeah. As far as, you know, personal lives and living in environments and what have you, it just, uh, yeah, it really shaped human lives. Yeah. For a while, they were actually roommates. One of the, Is one of the right? seasons I was up there. Yeah. They were living together. I mean, they really were, they really were brothers. And to your point, I mean, you know, Rob and I dipped in and out of that show for all 15 years and I, I never was on that set where they didn't 
introduce themselves to guest stars. They never got too cool for their own shoes. You know what I mean? They would still be good dudes. That was my experience. Yeah. I, I, I was very humbled and honored uh, and proud if that's not condescending that that's the way they chose to conduct themselves. I mean, throughout. So that's just, it's just a cool thing that you could, you can be an asshole or you can be cool. I'm delighted. They chose to be cool. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting as we're all sitting here saying that going, wow, it speaks a lot to the industry itself and not in a good way. That kindness is shocking behavior. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> You're like, yeah. oh man, wow. They they didn't hate That's on people. That's the exception. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's, but they were good dudes. They're, you know, they. No, I always said that. Like coming to working on Supernatural, it really was different from other sets. You you did, you felt very welcome. The guys were so welcoming and it became a family. On set, it was like a family. J.J. Abrams sets were also very similar to that, but you don't get that a lot. Yeah. And I, I, I think, A, it's the civil thing to do, but also I think it results in the best work. I think it holds up. I mean, I'd love to talk a little bit about Hookman. I mean, Hookman is a brilliant movie that speaks to everything that goes into the magic of the genre, in my mm-hmm. humble opinion. And again, that was Eric and everybody else who was involved in the writer's room at that time. But just you have effectively the cowboy shape of two guys ride into town on their trusty horse, which in this case is the Impala. And there's a problem that's based in urban myth, but it's not some Gothic Mm -hmm. castle. It's your backyard, which makes it more resonant and close to home. You have pretty girls. And should you behave in an immoral capacity, you will be punished. So there's a vague Judeo-Christian runner through there. It's got all these things that are working on the deep, well, not so deep unconscious, the thinly veiled unconscious of the audience. And you're going, holy shit. And it's drawing you in and it's drawing you in. And it's just, it's wonderful to watch. And there's a little bit of a flip where you think the reverend dad is going to be the bad guy, but indeed the spirit is occupying the daughter because she's wearing the cross around her neck that was melted down from the hook. It's Mm -hmm. very resolved and just enough flips at the act out to keep you engaged and salivating for what's going to come next. Mm -hmm. And all the while, you know, one of the boys is going to sometimes metaphorically, sometimes literally kiss the girl. And then with a heavy heart, Right on out of town on the steel horse. Yeah, man. You know, it, yeah. it's just that, yeah, there you go. Totally. And it's just yeah. that that's primal storytelling. And Eric understood that. And that's why I think the show's just so good. And you're like, why am I enjoying this so much? Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking it's it's a horse or it's their Millennium Falcon. Correct. And you know, Kripke was obsessed with Harrison Ford. There's some story about like he wanted to have the name be Harrison or something. I'm going to get that wrong, but, but it just, yeah, because he, everything oh, wow. was like, he's like Harrison Ford. He's like, you know, Han Solo. He was so obsessed with Han Solo. Yeah. Dean. De- De- yeah. And, and, and I'm like, Kripke, yeah. pump your brakes. I mean, I get it. You know, he, he's, he's a gunslinger in, <laughs> in Spaceville and uh, it was hysterical just, yeah. just listening to the passion. He was right. Yeah, no, Hookman is great. And Hookman, uh, they also use the, and they, they do it a lot in season one. It's the, I think of it as the Jaws, way of shooting the villain you don't see him like you only see the hook like you only see the fin and you really don't see him until the end you get a more of an idea of what he actually looks like yeah it definitely has that old sort of slasher film vibe yeah a, a hook man specifically that was the goal i mean th- i'm glad you, it felt as such because that's right. precisely the goal of like you know you see the hook is tearing up the wall on approach to the car and you don't see the the menacing villain just as the shark and well they had right. the benefit of an unrivaled score but that was a character in Jaws, of course. But I mean, it just, yeah, that that style, instead of like, show it, show it, show it, splatter, splatter, splatter. It's like what you imagine is indeed more terrifying than what you would see. So that was something that Eric deeply understood mm-hmm. also. And the editors did a very good job bringing that together. And that was no accident. I mean, that was from the pitch days, yeah. that was the plan. I would also say that you guys were able to incorporate early on. And look, we, we're looking through the lens of history. So we know how far effects have come. But effect, the effects were great in that show. And that was 16, 17 years ago that yeah. it was shot. You know, you're doing practical effects on like the plaster coming off the wall with the scrape or whatever. However, that was executed. And it plays fantastic. You don't miss a beat. Yeah, that's just a piece of string in the wall that you erase the string and you pull it out as it, it comes along. So it was a hybrid of old school in camera stuff and then some effects. And we had no money. We didn't have any money and it wasn't as easy back then to just, you know, sort of digitally fix everything in the mix, as they say. And um, yeah, that was the goal that we never wanted to lean too heavily on CG, CG, CG. We wanted to have that Sam Raimi kind of patina of realism. Yeah. And again, I asked Steven Spielberg how the shark performed on Jaws. It was a fucking disaster. You know, it right. didn't work. It didn't matter. Right. The, the, the right. film was too good. It was too resolved. Yeah. Quinn was too well written. Nothing could stop it. Even though on the day out at sea, they're like, oh my God, I'm going to jump in the ocean and just drown myself because I can't get this rubber shark to behave and work. 
it, yeah, it wouldn't behave, and that's one of the reasons they had to shoot it the way they did, which became one of the reasons it was so scary, is you never saw the shark until the very end. We, we had similar, well, maybe not such seismic disadvantages, but we had similar challenges where we couldn't just like throw money at it and fix it. That was never a move we could make. We were constantly being yelled at by our bosses. <laughs> yeah, that, no, that's a great point, because again, you said earlier, you know, you're trying to make it cinematic, but in cinema, traditionally, you have a got, you've got a lot more money, and here you're, you're making a WB show and you don't have that kind of money that's the challenge right you know in terms of the mix that came together to make this show and you're such a part of that like season one talking hookman what was your producer job was it sort of did you get the scripts yeah i would read the scripts and we would talk about them but my big producer job was primarily casting working on the rough cuts giving the script notes and then again being that conduit of we'd go in and we'd meet with the big bosses and they'd sort of look at eric and then they'd look at me because Eric was still, the show hadn't become the success that we all so naturally regarded to be today. Right. So they would kind of go like, are you back in this shit up, McGee? And I'm like, yeah, it's going to be great. Kripke's got this. It's awesome. Let's roll. And that was, it's a small role to play, but it was, a, it was I, I think, an essential role to play at that time so he could do his thing and fulfill his vision. Um, so yeah, I mean, touching all the things, but really just being the guarantor of what the promise was from Eric. Because again, it wasn't like the ratings were so outstanding that it was automatic and we could do whatever we wanted. Right. That was more like Josh's experience on the OC. The OC came out swinging. Supernatural was a build and became you know a juggernaut. Right. So it was just a little bit different. And that was primarily my roles, especially early on. Um, so yeah. Hookman, this, this specific episode that we're focused on, that's early in the season. How many of those stories have been broken before you guys even started shooting? Like, did you know a Hookman story was coming? And yes, Eric had, it was such a great engine. It's like every week we're going to tell an urban legend. And whether it's, you know, Bloody Mary or it's Hookman or yeah, it's, it, there's so many to choose from. Mm -hmm. And I love Kripke's idea that there was as much resolve in those stories as in of American horror mythology and beyond, but as the great, religions of the world. I mean, these are things that are sort of, how did they come to be in the collective consciousness, therefore unconsciousness of the world? And then we would just play upon those things. Here's a question. How much casting were you involved in after the fact? Meaning like you had Jared and Denson and now you're cruising on. Did you get heavily involved in Jane McGregor, who's the big guest lead on Hookman? Is that somebody whose tape you approved or were you involved in that process as well? Did they have tape? Back. Yeah, because remember, uh, at some point, Bob Singer was talking about how they would still get tape. Uh, guys, them. it was tape. It was yeah. straight up tape. It wasn't like we had the digital pick system and did the thing. Right. But yeah, in the early days, the primary guest stars, we would approve. Stephanie did a lot of that. Peter Johnson did a lot of that. And I just had a lot of faith in the team. So I largely stayed out of the way. Because the yeah, actors I mean, are really good. I mean, like, if you go back always. again, another thing stars. that holds up. The guest stars are great. And a lot of them went well, on to I mean, have their we own. We were so lucky to get Jeffrey Dean Morgan to come and do the pilot and then be a part of it, you know, the lineage. Right. And uh, yes, but I mean, my, my job was primarily putting the, the regulars together. And of course, as led by Jared and Jensen. And then uh, as confidence grew, then there were less and less approval steps required. Gotcha. And there was more and more, hey, you're amazing, Eric. Keep on going. Do it your way. Kim Manners, singer, everybody. Sarah Gamble was there very early on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just a bunch of smart people that very quickly got the boss's heads moving north-south in a way right. of like, okay, you guys do what you do. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. There wouldn't be a Supernatural had Kripke not come into your office one day and pitched you the show and you nodded, okay, let's do this. So the audience the fans, the people who worked on the show, owe you a, a, an enormous debt of gratitude for greenlighting this whole juggernaut. So well, well done, sir. I'm humbled and honored. It's really a delight to be a part of it. And um, yeah, it's it's very touching. And it's one of the, the luckiest things and most enjoyable things that's ever happened to me, certainly in my professional career and beyond. Got a lot of good friends and you know we're all still very much in touch. And there was not really any drama along the way. And I'm very proud of that. Yeah. There was no mega blowout nightmare scenarios. And it just, that speaks to the people who put the show together. Absolutely. And, you know, it speaks to the goodwill of the fandom too. I mean, just watching people freak out and Hall H and all things carry on my wayward side and just you guys are part of it and the yeah. whole thing is just it's the way it should be it's yeah. fun and it's impactful and it's awesome it's fun to think that you know it, it went from eric in your office pitching star wars in small town america and now and then cut to kansas playing hall h yeah. for all for six thousand people 
I you know. know, on behalf of Supernatural. So thanks. You're such a, an icon in the industry, and uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you, and, and thanks for being a part of this. Thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. Anytime. I'm cool. so proud of the show, and I'm really, really thankful for what you're putting forward here. Thank you. Awesome. awesome. Thanks awesome, so much, buddy. Mickey. What a guy. That was awesome. So great. And now we get to continue the behind-the-scenes chat yeah. with the big actress of the episode, Jane McGregor. She played Lori. She was the, the main guest star for Hookman. And yeah. now we're going to talk to her. Such a treat to have with us today the actress that played Lori in the episode, Jane McGregor. Yeah, man. Hi, Jane. All right. Hello. First oh. of all, let me say, you look exactly like you did when you yeah, shot the God. episode. You haven't <laughs> aged at all. So when did you sign your pact with Satan? Because you literally oh. have not aged. Oh, thank you. Very early on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Jane, so are you, just real quick, are you, uh, we're talking to you, are you, do you live, where do you live? Uh, I live in Vancouver. Okay, cool. Oh, great. Okay. So this was this was shot in your backyard, not literally, but right there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Local actor. Great. So, so Jane, you had a huge role in this episode. This is not a guest star comes in, does two scenes, and goes away. Like it, it starts with you, it ends with you. Like the whole yeah episode. That was cool. So I assume that means you were you were uh, the the run of the the days you were in every day working on the on the show, correct? Yeah, yep. I mean, I'm trying to remember if it was like a two week shoot that they did or but yeah, it was a big job for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my first horror gig. Was there any in the in the audition? Do you remember which what your audition scenes were? I think the scenes in my audition were talking with Sam. So uh -huh. I don't think any of the big screams were in the audition room, just sort of the relationship and the drama there and her coping with her, her shame and her anger and those scenes. Yeah. It's good because, you know, sometimes you go to those auditions and they're like, okay, do the scene where you shriek. Yeah. Five That's what I was thinking. A lot of times for <laughs> right. horror, you know, horror movies, right. like, let's hear your scream. Yeah, no. But you had a good um, one. You have a great scream. You have a very good scream. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's not every day you hear that. Um, yeah, well, that makes sense because, it, you know, what's I think key in your, your role in this is that you and Sam have an instant connection when you sort of first lay eyes on him right. in the church. Right. You can see there's, there's a connection there. Yeah, I, I got to say, yeah. you did a great job in the episode, by the way. It's one of those, you know, we keep, we're revisiting the show. It's 15 years old at this point. You probably shot it 16 years ago. And and the episodes hold up. I mean, the episodes, the stories, it's, it's still very good TV. Yeah, you know, you're wondering what's going on. And there's some fun stuff between the relationship. And you're like, what? It's hard to believe she's killing all these people. I, it, was, it was very <laughs> jarring. Yeah. Yeah. She you didn't mean to. Her, she didn't you know. She's just so pure. <laughs> Um, so yeah. I have a question for you in the process of doing a guest star role, mm -hmm. you're, you're coming into a, a show that's already moving and you're like leaping in right. to do your part, but you're, a, you know, you go from yesterday, they were shooting a different episode and today it's all about you and you're shooting this episode. How far, and this is a question I don't know if you'll remember because this is a, a an, I know this okay. has been a few months and you've shot this, Yeah, yeah. but do you remember how many days in to the shoot before you had to make out with Jared? And I asked that for a reason, because I think it's yeah. an interesting job that actors have where it's where they walk into a room like, hi, uh, I'm Jane. Nice to meet you, Jared. Uh, so right. let's go make out. And then uh, I'll, I'll learn more about you. I mean, it's a little yeah. bit, it can be, it can be awkward in that regard. Right. You know, I think it was a while. I think it was kind of like halfway through the shoot, which that is helps. smart. You know, you're a little more relaxed. So when you have to do something that's maybe a little more awkward, you're like, hey, we're doing a job here. Yeah, I think we might have started with some of the church stuff and that stuff was later on. But I do remember that my little Boston Terrier dog attacked Jared's husky dogs <sighs> on set. And oh that was God. pretty hilarious. Oh, <laughs> my God. That's amazing. <laughs> I was like, Rudy, oh, no. <laughs> Um, yeah, I remember anyways, that. He had, he had no, he had no shot of winning. That's hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> no, Jared not. Jared had two big dogs. He's a big man with big dogs. He likes big things. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. <laughs> so here's a question for you: When you're doing this kind of is this episode specifically, especially this early on in the show, very much had a '80s slasher vibe in sort of its style. At any point, 
was it creepy? I mean, I know it's like you're shooting the TV show and there's a boom guy there and a prop guy there. But in doing any of this, in the chasing and the execution of these sequences where the hookman's about to take you guys out, is there anything that was especially like, wow, this set's bizarre or this is actually kind of creepy or ooh, anything like that? I actually, when I have a memory of doing the running and the chasing and the stunt work, I actually had a really fun time doing all that stuff. So it was actually kind of the opposite. (laughs) It was like quite fun. Yeah. Because always when you're doing your work, you're that has its own energy and that can involve different stuff. But as far as like running and getting chased, I find that physicality and like that was the first time I kind of done some stunt work where I got to like I was on this little trolley and they like shot it across the room super fast and oh wow it was really cool I was like this is awesome I I gotta get more stunt work <laughs> I, I, I know what scene you're talking about when, when you basically get flung back into that other room yeah that was a cool shot that was a cool <laughs> shot but yeah I mean the night when we shot with that truck out there I think we were shooting nights and it was a it was a long day and yeah i remember finding out like hanging upside down is actually like a quite a hard stunt to do and oh, to be very careful yeah. because you can really hurt yourself and so he had to hang completely upside down and he was like yeah this is actually pretty it doesn't seem that like that big of a deal but it's a pretty edgy stunt i can only hang upside down for a certain amount of seconds and yeah anyways the crew and everyone did a really good job of being really safe that day so, so. that was a stunt man not that actor that was a stunt man doing that yeah that was a stunt man and he was actually did most of the hookman stuff i think the actor who played hookman just came in like a couple of times right. so yeah, he was mm-hmm. just the face. Well, you don't see much of the hook man, so you can no. get away with it being a stunt person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. We were saying, mm-hmm. we were saying, uh, we talked to Mick G earlier. We were saying that uh, what was interesting about this episode is you you see the hook, you see him scratching, but you really don't get many shots of the hook man, and that's what makes it scary. Right. Yeah. Mystery. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's what you don't see. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Totally. Yeah. All right. So now, again, I, I'm going back to the memory bank. I know it's a long time memory ago. Memory bank. But I want to hear. I want to know your favorite thing about shooting the episode, and oh. I want to know your least favorite. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, my God. So Asking the tough questions. Yeah. Dark. Okay. Then my favorite thing was zooming on a little trolley. Right. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. That's kind of cool. It's always neat when you get to be a part of something that you don't usually do. And yeah, yeah, yeah. There. So that was cool, and my least favorite. Oh, my gosh. The Working Nights. I think that might have even been a reshoot. I'm going to go night shoot. Night no shoot. Good. Yeah. Least favorite. I <laughs> yeah, get it. Yeah. We were told that they, uh, that one of the reasons this was uh, aired later was because they were, uh, they wanted to make it scarier. It was just that scene that was a reshoot and they recast the guy. I think oh. maybe the first guy was too nice. Ah. <laughs> you mean the guy, so, what, the Rich, guy, Rich, Rich, the character Rich. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, so he was recast, and we had already shot that stuff, and so then they shot it again when we were doing the exteriors. We reshot the truck. Inside. Oh, interesting! So that's really that interesting. That had already been shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were saying earlier that 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 guy was specifically creepy. We were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> bad dude, <laughs> not a good guy. It's like when you're watching a horror movie and there's a real jerk, and you're like, well, that guy's gonna die. Yeah, <laughs> and you know what? Not sorry to see him go. No, that's my thought on the whole thing. <laughs> You played it really well and uh, oh, really brought it you. to life. And I think, thank you know, you. that's what makes horror horror episodes of TV or horror films, what makes them work is the the person that the horror is happening to. So we you know, we felt that along with you. And, yep. you know, waking up oh. and your roommate's been murdered and there's blood drawn on the wall. Like, it's terrifying. Right. Yeah. But we see that yeah. through your eyes. And that's, I think, what makes this episode work. Yeah. And as a performer, you know, you're brought in to do the heavy lifting on a show that's barely up his often running on its own yeah that's a big ask and you nailed it you did a great job it's a great episode oh thanks guys that's nice <laughs> thank you and jane thank you for being a part of our podcast we appreciate it all right yes thanks for having me yeah. absolutely hey there this is jared padalecki and i hope you're enjoying the episode but we gotta pull over for a second for some messages Thank you for supporting Supernatural then and now. And now, back to the show. 
Um, and now it's time for mythology. Mythology notes. If they don't, if they don't put notes. reverb on this, we're going to sound really lame. I like that we're doing our own songs just in the studio. Doop, doop, doop. Mythology notes. Exactly. Um, so the Hook Man, the version of the Hook Man, uh, is based on different urban legends that you've heard. Again, I told it as a kid. Did you ever t- tell the Hook Man story? No, but when you just started that sentence, I thought you said Look Man because you said the Hook Man, and I thought... Look. That'd be that'd be awkward if you're Hook Man and people are going like, "Look, man, Hook Man, <laughs> <laughs> look, it's a man. book, man." <laughs> like you could really get in a weird rhythm. Look, man, <laughs> it's Hook Man. I'm just Hook Man. Um, but did you, you never told that? I didn't. I didn't know no. the story. It's like two couples on two. It's a couple on a date in a car, right? And and there's someone uh, escaped from some mental facility or something, and he oh, had God. a hook for a hand. Oh, ugh. yeah. Anyway, what happened? You, you, don't leave me hanging. I don't know. It ends where you hold up a hook in your hand. Oh, great. Yeah. Hey, don't scare me yeah. like that, right? Well, Bill Murray tells it in, uh, in Meatballs. Which, I, yeah, I saw that. Again, a comedy that uh, we all grew up in. If you haven't seen Meatballs, I don't know whether or not you should go see it because I don't know if it, it held up. But when we were kids, Meatballs was such a great it's, uh, it's summer literally camp h- comedy. It's a hilarious movie that you must see unless there's anything offensive or untimely in it, in which case, how dare you? Don't blame us. Yeah. What, what else can we say mythology-wise? Well, uh... It's speculated Mm -hmm. by people that I know well Mm -hmm. that the Hookman urban legend might have been inspired by the real-life Texarkana moonlight murders of 1946. Oh, my God. Back when you were an eighth grader. (laughs) Eight people were attacked in a 10-week period, typically couples alone at night. However, here's this (laughs) little (laughs) hook. It's not a hook. He used a gun. Oh, okay. So this is... (laughs) <laughs> they called him Gunman. Gunman. <laughs> <laughs> Besides that one so small So you've ever heard the term the Gunman, th- they refer, it's really an homage to this guy. <laughs> it's really the exact same thing, minus that one little factoid. And basically, it has nothing to do with this guy. <laughs> uh, the legend started to appear around the 1950s. Dear Abby... <laughs> published a version of it in 1960 and we don't need to explain who Dear Abby is because that's a timely reference that everyone gets. Well, Dear Abby was a columnist who um, who would write editorials in, a, in the paper. No, it wasn't. It. Somebody, people wrote her letters. People write in, hey, Dear Abby, I'm having problems with my podcast partner. <laughs> <laughs> My advice, sir, uh, is to quit. <laughs> uh, a version of the story also appears in the 1981 book Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, which is, I think, kind of almost the Bible of Supernatural, really. It was an hey. influence on uh, a lot of the storylines. Um, there's a really uh, a freaky part in this episode where the hook man has written on the wall in blood and hook, uh, aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? Which I had to say, I wondered how he did that all in the dark. It's hard to get good penmanship. Here's what I thought was weird. It's carved into the wall, but he's not, he's not javelin man. Like it, it, he's got to like no, he's crane gotta... his wrist around to get towards the wall yeah. and write very neat penmanship. Yeah. He's also got to dip the hook in blood like a pin in, 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 in a quill. And Which ink. you must have to keep going back and yeah, back. Yeah, back to the blood. Um, so that's actually lifted from a different urban legend. He's not needle guy. Like, he doesn't no. have, like, a big needle that comes out of his hand. <laughs> yeah. He can't just write on a yeah. wall. Calligraphy guy. Um, the, e- e- egad. <laughs> the phrase also appears in the 1998 film Urban Legends. That uh, Or does it? Maybe the fact that it appears in the 1998 film Urban Legend is just an urban legend. Uh, Killers with a hook for a hand have appeared in other films. The no. Can- yeah, the Candyman franchise. And also, I Know What You Did Last Summer. I Know What You Did Last Summer. We talk all the time. <laughs> Knit by the pool. <laughs> Why are you making a point about the fact that we know each other's schedules? I Know What You Did Most of the Fall. I'm not bringing it up. <laughs> anyway, uh, needless to say, the Hookman legend has been around in different forms for years, and uh, and now we could say uh, that it was represented in the 2005 TV series Supernatural. Um, time for a little trivia. Be- trivia. Be- trivia. Be- trivia. Be- 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 <laughs> that was our trivia song. Um, it was originally set to air third after Wendigo, but the team needed more time to work on the scares. Ah. And I think they got it. I think they achieved it. How? So what episode? This is seven. Oh, so they bumped it a few further down the road. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm curious what scares they put in or that they, they worked on. I mean, certainly there's the, 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 room, the roommate who's, uh, who's, um, who likes to make out with, with fellas. Uh, she gets killed. 
I don't know if that was in there originally. What do you mean she likes to make out with That was the whole point, is that she was... No, she's mildly more social. What are you, the prudish priest father now? Good Lord. I could have gone up for that. Sam uses the Impala's spotlight in this episode. I noticed that. Um, Does it always have a spotlight, Rich? I don't recall it having a spotlight, but... Because you've put the camera on that car. I have. Um, It's removed after season three. There you go. there you go. We've answered our own (laughs) question. If we read the work before we started talking... Uh, Art department said Impala's with spotlights got hard to find. Huh. Well, so basically the art department's a bunch of quitters. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, the Hookman's cross is a Jerusalem cross. While the symbol dates back to the 11th century, in the 20th century, it became associated with the world evangelization in Protestantism. Can you re say that? We do for not me? need to try that again because that word's great. Uh, the, with the world evangelization in Protestant. Okay. Pro- pro- Sorry, oh, everybody. No, never mind. <laughs> um, and then also, this is the episode uh, where it is established that rock salt is a deterrent to spirits. Mm -hmm. I I was thinking that. I was like, since when do you use a shotgun on ghosts? And then he says... We have rock salt in there. Yeah. And it won't kill them, but it'll slow them down. Really? He says that at one point. Okay. When he hands the gun, the the shotgun to the... Oh, it's a different episode, actually. Different episode, different episode yeah, yeah. But nonetheless, it's, yeah, yeah. it's revealed there. Well, I had it written down, like, shotguns kill... I was going to say it on the podcast, like a funny thing, like, since when do guns kill ghosts? And then a couple episodes later, he explains. Right. Like, oh, and I had to cross that out on my notes. All right, time for old stuff, the stuff that Rob gets. Now it's time for old stuff. Old <laughs> stuff. Old stuff. Hello, this is Rich Fate, your host for Old Stuff, where we bring up things from the show Supernatural that now seem incredibly dated, much like my ensemble today. Um, old stuff. Lori has a flip phone in the opening scene under the bridge. Now, the old part here is bridges. They no longer exist, and now we use teleport machines to get over bodies of water. Obviously. Or, no, wait, maybe it's the flip phone. I think it's the flip phone. Oh. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's the flip phone. Okay, see, flip phone. And by the way, flip phones are back. Are they? Yeah, they're like... Sam, one of those phone companies has oh, like the whole, right. the whole screen yeah. folds in half. Yeah, T- time always resurfaces. We've got it? like the bell bottoms. Flip phones are back. More old stuff. When we first see Sam in this episode, he's actually played by Jared Leto. <laughs> <laughs> Different Jared. <Yeah. laughs> no, he's on a payphone. Oh, yeah, he's on a payphone. Uh, which again, we you don't not only do you not use payphones, you don't see payphones. There's... And I tell you what, if you're in New York and you see a payphone, you don't touch payphones. No, you don't. Especially COVID. Um, next up, the boys spend time researching in a building that houses books called a library. I've never, I don't know what I that know. is. I it's know. It, there's books in there. Basically, it's like a giant computer, only instead of just typing in Google, you have to go and actually find the stuff yourself. It's a nightmare. Yeah. Um, yeah. So rather than now, they would just use the uh, interwebs. Right. But uh, back then, they had to go to... The library. They still call it the interwebs, right? I'm sure they do. And that was our edition of Old Stuff. Well, that was fun to talk to, to Jane McGregor, who played Laurie in that episode. Oh, man, to have two uh, people uh, on this podcast. <laughs> well, I guess we're, there's always two people on the podcast, but it's usually you and me. Right. It's nice to have two interviews. Yeah. But, to, like, Jane, what a delight. Yeah. And, by, by the way, I feel like we really were taxing her memory, trying to get her to I know. Well, <laughs> flank back on 16 Yeah, years. you realize, yeah, it's, it's 15, 16 years ago. And she worked for, you know, seven days on it. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, what was your second day like? But McG, I mean, like, without McG, without, without McG there's no Mc, McSeer. Series. No, he's he's a McLegend, yeah. and I was McNervous to talk uh, to him. I could McTell. <laughs> um, More nervous than usual. He was, he, what an interesting guy, what an interesting career he's had, and I mean, the story of the story of yeah. how Kripke came in and pitched it, and, and right. Peter's passion, Yeah, his passion for Kripke, yeah. and then Kripke's passion for the yeah. show. It's really interesting to hear how it all came, came together. Yeah, well, and I was really fascinated with the idea that what he brought to it was this knowledge of cinema and that they were looking to make this not just be another TV show, but something that was akin to what HBO was doing at the time right. uh, with The Sopranos, Six Feet Under, series that felt more like movies than yeah. just series. He put an interesting lens on it in terms of television history. Right. Television was doing something different back then than, it, than it's doing now. And then that gave way to, um, not to say that su- because of Supernatural, but Supernatural was a part of this new wave of, of television making where they were trying to make it cinematic. And right. then before you know it, you've got, you know, uh, Mad Men on AMC, you know, the, the fledgling uh, cable networks were making these great 
series that, that lasted a long time and made, made an impression. McG was at the forefront of all That's that. That's right. That was awesome. All right, another great one. Thanks for listening, everyone. Oh, man, that was just uh, one for the one for the vault, man, to it get McG in here. really was. Unbelievable. Uh, such a legend. Yeah. Uh, we say legend a lot when we talk about McG. Um, yeah, the only other person I use that with is, is you, Rich. Oh, uh, Me? It's always John Legend. Right. <laughs> Whenever I talk about John Legend. <laughs> I talk about the movie Legend a lot. Yeah, but other than that, just McG. Right. This episode stars Jared Padalecki as Sam Winchester, Jensen Ackles as Dean Winchester. Guest stars include Jane McGregor as Laurie, Christy Lang as Taylor, Dan Butler from Fraser as Reverend Sorensen, uh, Brian Scala as Rich, and Alf Humphreys as the Sheriff. Hookman was written by John Chabon and directed by David Jackson. Edited by David Exram. Music by Christopher Leonard. Executive produced by Eric Kripke and Robert Singer. The original broadcast featured some amazing music from bands like Split Habit, Quiet Riot, Boston, Union of Knives, and it first aired October 25, 2005. This episode of Supernatural Then and Now was hosted and executive produced by Richard Spade Jr. and Rob Benedict. Produced by Stephen Hine. Written by Stephen Hine and Hayda Holscher. Audio engineering by Caitlin Holly. And edited and associate produced by Trey Booty. What's up, buddy? Not much, buddy. Music provided by Tim Wynn. The episode was recorded with the help of Sonic Fuel Studios. This podcast is from Story Mill Media. For news on this and other podcasts, follow Story Mill Media on Instagram and Twitter. But not on Facebook. F off. Jane, thanks don't, so much for doing this. Don't even talk oh, yet. Yeah. The, the counter's not not rolling, Rob. You're going to waste gold. Uh, yeah, I'm just, telling, I'm just saying hi to Jane. No, but that kind of stuff is magic. <laughs> right. You know, to be honest, I might just be making that up. Well, that's you okay. It's, it's, all, it's all new to us. We believe you. Oh, we believe you. believe me. Great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um. Nice. Recording stopped. Story Bell Media. <laughs>